Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, Joyce will be teaching a spirit-filled message entitled, Thinking Your Way Out of Bondage. I would like you to open your Bibles up to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Tonight, we're going to talk about thinking your way out of bondage. Last night and this morning, I did some teaching about the battlefield that goes on in our mind. And I just particularly really enjoyed the teaching this morning. I've actually decided to make a video out of that because I just feel like we need to get it out to as many people as we can. How you think, the attitude that you have, what you say, and how you act while you're in the wilderness determines how long you're going to stay there. Now, what is the wilderness? The wilderness is this period of time after we're saved before we finally feel like that we've got victory and we're living in the promises of God. You know, it's, it's one thing to hear about the promises of God. It's, it's one thing to talk about the promises of God, to want the promises of God, to believe for the promises of God, but it's another thing entirely to actually be living in and experiencing the promises of God. It's one thing to believe for prosperity. It's another thing to have it. It's one thing to believe for your loved ones to be saved. It's another, one to, it's another thing to see them walking with God. It's one thing to have a dream and a vision for your life, for various things to be better. But it's another thing entirely when you're actually living out that dream and it's happening. We all go through a wilderness time. The Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves there, being severely mistreated. They cried out for a deliverer. God sent a man named Moses, equipped and anointed, to lead them out of bondage. They headed for the promised land, a land filled with milk and honey and where the fruit grew very large. And they were to go in and possess the land. However, even there, there was enemies in the land that would have to be conquered. And God's goal was that during this time in the wilderness, He would prepare them to go in boldly and take the land. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2, amazing thing it says there. I never get over the amazement of it. Why have you spent 40 years making an 11-day journey? Now, I want you to think about that. They spent 40 years making an 11-day journey. In verse 6 of Deuteronomy 1, it says, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. And I believe that I can say that to some of you tonight. You've dwelt long enough at the mountain of self-pity. You've dwelt long enough at the mountain of irresponsibility. You've dwelt long enough at the mountain of blaming everybody else for everything that goes wrong. You've dwelt long enough at the mountain of laziness. Some of you have been at the same place way too long. <laughs> Going around and around and around and around the same stuff. There's a place in Hebrews where it says, even though you ought to be teaching others now, I still have to feed you with milk because you're not yet ready for meat and I have to keep going over and over and over the same things. We have to move on past the things in our lives that are keeping us in bondage. And your mind and your attitude have everything to do with how much time you're going to spend in the wilderness. We all have problems. We all have tribulation. We all have people who don't like us. We all have people who come against us. We all have people that we expected more out of than what we got. We all have disappointments. We all have shattered dreams. 
but how we respond to them makes all the difference in the world. And the devil fills our minds with junk, stinking thinking. And if you have stinking thinking, you're going to have a stinking life. If your life is a mess, it's because your mind is a mess. Did you hear what I said? If your life is a mess, it's because your mind is a mess. How do I know that? Because I believe the Bible, Proverbs 23, 7, says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I've modernized it a little bit, and I say it this way. Where the mind goes, the man follows. We have to learn how to think like God wants us to think. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we have been given the mind of Christ. Well, what would Jesus think? <laughs> you know, everybody wore those little bracelets for a while, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Maybe we need to make a new one, WWJT, what would Jesus think? Our thoughts prepare us for action. We talked about so many good things last night and again this morning that I cannot go over. But I don't want to see people live in bondage all their life. I lived in bondage myself for enough years and I know what it's like. And I don't want to see you be in bondage to anything. Jesus died to set us free. And we need to set our minds for freedom. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind and keep it set. You got to keep your mind set on the promised land and you got to keep pressing toward that promised land. And when circumstances in here try to hinder you or hold you back or try to do to you what they did to the Israelites, try to drive you back to Egypt. Every time they turned around, whenever they had problems out in the wilderness, they wanted to run back to Egypt. I think sometimes we make a mistake by not telling people when they accept Christ that they're going to have some tough times. I'm not going to tell you if you accept Christ as your Savior that you're never going to have another hard day. But I will tell you, you'll never have to try to solve your problems by yourself because God will be with you the rest of your days to help you and walk you through hard places. And I will tell you that your worst day with Jesus will be better than your best day ever was without Him. Whatever you do as a believer, when you start to have hard times or you have disappointments... Don't backslide and go back where you came from. Keep pressing on. Keep a good attitude. Keep a positive confession. Don't let the devil fill your mind full of junk. I'm going to say it again. How you think, the attitude you have, what you say, and how you act while you're in the wilderness determines how long you will stay there. My question to you is how long is it going to be? 40 years or 11 days? How many of you have already been there a lot longer than you wish you would have been there? Okay. Something that amazes me, and I can't keep from repeating this again tonight, although I didn't intend to. Somewhere around a million and a half, two million people were led out of Egypt, headed for the promised land. And the Bible teaches us that of that original million and a half or two million people that came out, only two people, two of that original group actually crossed the Jordan and went into the promised land. That percentage and statistic is almost mind-boggling. I don't know what it is, but it's probably way less than one-tenth of one percent. Two people out of almost two million. Now, there were children born out there, and they're the ones who actually were led in by Joshua and Caleb. And the only reason why Joshua and Caleb went in is because God said they had a different spirit than everybody else. Caleb was the kind of guy that when he was 80, he said, give me a mountain, because I'm just as strong today as I was when I was 40. But you know what? That was an attitude he had. It was a mindset he had. You know what? You can get an old mentality. I'm too old. Or you can get a mentality that says, I'm too young. 
Or you can get a mentality that says, I don't have enough education. I don't have enough money. I don't have anybody to help me. But you know what you do have? You do have God. And we need to start thinking about what we do have and stop thinking about what we don't have. You need to think about what you're thinking about because many of you are defeating your own self with your own thoughts and there's not one thing that anybody can do to help you until you make your mind up that you're going to find out what this book says and you're going to line your thinking up with the Word of God. The mind is the battlefield. If Satan defeats you in your mind, he'll defeat you in your life. You have to choose your thoughts carefully. You have to learn how to recognize the lies of Satan, and you have to stop believing him. When the devil says you can't, you need to know that you can. When the devil says impossible, you need to remember that God said all things are possible. Well, the Israelites thought, just like we do very often, they thought that their problem was their enemies. It was the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Parasites and the <laughs> every other kind of ite. I think it's funny that all the names of all those people end with ites. Well, you know, we've all got our own brand of ites. It may be the bad bossites, the grouchy neighborites, the backacheites, <laughs> the kid that drives you crazyites, the husband you wish you'd have never marriedites, <laughs> the povertyites. Are you with me so far? But the fact of the matter is, it wasn't those enemies at all that were keeping them out of the promised land. You can live in the promised land and still not have all the money you'd like to have. You can live in the promised land and, and not, not be married to Mr. Perfect. You can live in the promised land and have a child that is hard to deal with. You can live in the promised land and have a boss that doesn't treat you right. You don't sound like you believe me. Because there's a place in God where we can rise above it. The devil can't have your joy if you won't give it to him. And he can't have your peace if you won't give it to him. When are you going to stop being unhappy about somebody else's bad choice? You didn't hear me, did you? When are you going to stop being unhappy about somebody else's bad choice and start living your life? Some of you just need to get a life. You're, trying, you're busy trying to make somebody else have a good life. Don't have the attitude, well, I hate my life. And a lot of people do. I hate my life. I hate my life. Well, you know what? It's the only life you've got right now. And you better embrace it and start making something out of it because hating it is not going to help you get rid of it. But I hate my life, and I hate myself, and I hate my job. Hate my car, hate my house. Hate my neighbors. Well, you know what? If you hate yourself, that's really dumb because you're stuck with you. Everywhere you go, there you are. I mean, you can't even go to the bathroom without you. You can't take a shower without you. I mean, come on, get some wisdom. I mean, do you know how miserable it is just to go visit somebody for 15 minutes that you really can't stand? It's no wonder a lot of people are miserable because they're living with somebody all the time. They can't stand themselves. <laughs> you need to say, this is it. Yes. I may not be what I'd like to be, but this is it. And I believe we got something to work with. Let's begin to make things better. I may not have the dream life I'd like to have, but this is the life I got, and I'm going to love it right now, and I believe God's going to help me get to where I need to be. It's all about attitude. It's all about your thoughts. Well, the Israelites thought, well, if we could just be in the promised land, we'd be happy, and since we can't be in the promised land, we might as well go back to Egypt. 
You know what? You cannot get over there without going through here. The only way out is through. You got to go through. So the Israelites thought it was their circumstances, their enemies that were making them unhappy. But God gave me a teaching, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, and I've done this in a lot of different ways. And what he showed me was a real eye-opener for me. I mean, a major, major eye-opener for me. And probably the beginning of a lot of the victories in my life. He said, it wasn't their enemies keeping them in the wilderness. It was their mindset. <laughs> they stayed in the wilderness because they had a wilderness mentality. And so I started searching the scriptures and I started looking at the Israelites' attitude. Because your mind, your thoughts produce your attitude. And I have a list of 10 things that I believe they had a bad attitude about. And I'm going to try to get through as many of them tonight as I can. And tomorrow we're going to go a little different direction, but tomorrow we're going to talk about the condition that our minds should be in at all times and how we need to learn to recognize when it's in a wrong condition and how we can change that and always walk in the mind of Christ. You can think your way out of bondage. So the first wrong thought pattern that I'd like to talk to you about tonight is thinking that your past dictates your future. Or that even what's going on in your life right now dictates your future. And here's the lie you'll hear from the devil. Well, it's all over. I've ruined my life. Anybody ever hear that one? That's it. It's the end. I've ruined my life. There's no hope. But you see, that's a lie. Go to Genesis 13. You know, when you have a loss of some kind, all it really has to be is an open door to a new beginning and something better than what you lost. Did you hear what I said? If you lose a job that you thought was the end all of everything, God can get you a better job than the one you lost. Don't ever let the devil steal from you. Sow things as a seed so God can bring a harvest. One of the girls on our team accidentally left her wedding ring in the hotel room and apparently somebody took it because she never got it back and it was a gift from her husband on, I think she said their 15th wedding anniversary and it was about a one carat cluster of diamonds. And I said to her the other day, I said, you know what, don't let the devil take it from you. Well, you might think, well, he's already taken it from her. But see, an attitude change can change that whole thing. I said, don't let the devil take it from you. Just say, okay, God, I'm going to sow it as a seed. I'm going to release it. I'm not going to be upset about it. I'm not going to be bothered about it. I just release it right now, and I'm sowing it for a harvest. And she said, that's a good idea. I got another anniversary coming up soon. <laughs> Amen. One time we were on a television station that was our best station and our ministry was a lot smaller than that station was really important to us. We were only on the station once a week. And just out of the blue, they called and said, we've decided to put something else in that time slot and so we're canceling your contract. I was like, well, how can you do that? We got a contract. So then the contract is no good at all because they can still do what they want to. And all of that made me so mad. Because we'd spent a lot of time building up an audience, and what they do sometimes is they use you to build up a good audience for them, and then they stick something else in that time slot. And you feel like you've been robbed. Well, I was so upset about that, and just, I felt that way. I just felt like, I've been robbed. How many of you ever feel that way? I've been robbed. And it makes you so mad, especially when there's nothing you can do about it. It doesn't really make you mad when you feel like that you've been robbed and there's nothing you can do about it. It's so frustrating when there's been an injustice 
and you just feel that something needs to be done, but there's nothing you can do. Shortly after that, I was in a church service on a Sunday, and the pastor was receiving the offering. And the Spirit of God spoke to me, and he said, put that television station in the offering. Now, obviously, I couldn't put it in there physically, but I knew what he meant, that spiritually, I needed to put that in the offering. Come on, somebody can get something out of this tonight. Somebody here can release some pain. You can release some hurt. You can release some injustices. He said, put that in the offering. Sow it as a seed. Don't ever let the devil think that he's stolen something from you. Give it to me. It may look like the devil took it from you, but you can give it to me and I'll bring a harvest in your life. Now, as God is my witness, do you know what happened? About a year later, that station, which happens to be a station that airs all over the U.S., it's a big network, called us and said, we'd like you to come on our station every day. I was on one day, the devil took it, I sowed it as a seed, and they asked me to come on every day, and it's one of our number one stations today. But can you see mentally how the devil can get you stuck at a problem? And the more you think about what's been done to you, the more bitter you become. And the more you think about what's been done to you, the madder you get. And the madder you get, the littler your life becomes. Everything in us begins to shrink and shrivel when we get angry and mad and bitter because we've been mistreated. But our God is a God of justice. And you know what that means? Do you know what it means when you study the word justice? God makes everything that's wrong right eventually. Everything that's wrong, God makes it right eventually. Isaiah 61, 7 and 8 were two verses of Scripture that I held on to so tightly in the early years of my walk with God because I was abused in my childhood and I had so many problems in my personality as a result of that. I was angry and rebellious and impatient and bitter and just on and on and on and on. And it was so hard for me to overcome those negative emotions in my life because feelings are strong. And especially wounded, bruised feelings. And it's hard to trust people when you've been hurt so badly by people. And it's hard to depend on other people when the people you've tried to depend on in the past have only hurt you. But I knew that I needed to be obedient to the Word of God. And Scripture is so powerful. There's a promise in Isaiah 61, 7 and 8 that says, For your former shame, for the shame of your youth, I was so ashamed because of what my dad had done to me. I carried so much guilt and felt so bad about myself. And I was still suffering because I felt guilty every single day of my life. And I had this nonstop recorded message that the devil played in my head from daylight till dark. What is wrong with me? 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 Has anybody else gotten that message? God says, for the shame of your youth, I will give you a double blessing, a double reward. I will compensate you. That means I'll make it up to you. Verse 8 says, for I, the Lord, love justice, and I hate robbery, and I hate wrongdoing. God's not happy when somebody takes advantage of you and he wants to help you. He wants to make it up to you and he wants to bring a reward in your life. But he can't if you have a bad attitude. Does anybody see that tonight? The first, you've got to sow your pain as a seed. 
And then God can bring a harvest in your life. That's why God's always trying to get us to forgive the people that hurt us. Forgiving them is giving it to God. Refusing to try to vindicate yourself is giving it to God. And when you give it to God and you walk in faith, He can bring a harvest in your life. When the devil tries to say to you, it's all over, you've ruined your life, you need to say no, no. This is just a chance for a brand new and a much better beginning. My question to you tonight is, what do you see for yourself? We need to be content where we're at, but we should never be totally satisfied to stay there. We need to always have goals. We need to always have dreams. We need to always be reaching in faith for something. Amen? The last book that I wrote, Approval Addiction, did get on the New York bestsellers list. I think it was, it got up as high as number nine. And you know what? That's great. I've never had a book on the New York bestsellers list. Hey, I was thankful. I was excited, but I ain't satisfied. I want to write a book that's number one. <laughs> We're on television in two thirds of the world and that is awesome. Who wouldn't be satisfied with that? I want to be on all over the world. One and see, that gives me a reason to live. It gives me a reason to get up. It motivates me. It flips my switch. It gives me something to look forward to, something to work toward. I'd rather, I would rather want everything and get half of it than to want nothing and get all of it. With no vision, people perish. Joseph had a dream. And you know what? His brothers hated him because he had a dream. And when you have a dream, you need to understand the devil's a dream thief. And he'll always come around and try to steal your dreams. And there will be things that will happen to you that will make it look like no way. It is never going to happen. No way. It's not going to work. And you need to say, don't tell me no way. I've got the way living on the inside of me. Jesus is the way. Come on, you better get some determination. You better get a Holy Ghost filled attitude and get rid of that wimpy worldly attitude that just gives up every time things get a little bit hard. Hallelujah. Well, Abraham was a man who kind of got cheated. He helped his nephew Lot Gave him some cattle. Gave him a lot of other stuff. Gave him a chance. It got to the point they were both so prosperous that they had so many cattle that there was not enough grass for them to stay together and their herdsmen had gotten into strife. And Abraham, being a godly man who knew the dangers of strife, went to Lot and he said, let there be no strife between us, I beg of you. You choose whatever part of the Jordan Valley that you won and I'll take what's left. That was an act of humility. He humbled himself to keep from having trouble. You know why? Because he knew if he behaved himself in a godly way that God would bless him. Well, sure enough, Lot took the best part of the Jordan Valley and Abraham ended up with the leftovers. Do you ever feel like you're one of the people that's always had hand-me-downs all your life and all you've ever had are the leftovers? Come on, how many of you feel that way sometimes? You feel cheated, like, you know, always the tail end of everything. Wore everybody's hand, hand me down clothes all my life. And whatever, you know, lived in my sister's shadow or my brother's shadow or, you know, whatever the deal might be. You know what? You got to shake that thing off. Come on. If you need to, you need to go stand in front of a mirror when this meeting is overnight and you need to say, I'm shaking off jealousy. I'm shaking off resent resentment. I'm shaking off bitterness. I'm getting rid of unforgiveness. I'm shaking off this bad attitude. Remember those little sucker demons I talked to you about last night? Like them little leeches? I said I watched a movie recently and a guy was in a river and when he got out he had this big black leech. 
And you know what they do? They suck the blood out of you, and they just get, sit there and get fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. It's like a tick. A tick's like that. And the guy that was going to get it off of him struck some matches and blew them out and stuck the hot match stick on the leech and the thing. I say, I think there's sucker demons that get after us. They try to attach themselves and just suck the life out of us. Come on. They work on your mind and they put all kinds of negative thoughts in your mind. Well, you know what? The Bible says that Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire. You need a little, put a little bit of that Holy Ghost fire on those sucker demons that are after you. <laughs> well, after Lot took the best part of the Jordan Valley, we look in verse 14 of Genesis 13, and it says, The Lord said to Abram after Lot had left him. Now just imagine, he was there by himself. He'd lost a lot. What he had left didn't look too promising. Somebody here tonight's in that position right now. And this is what God said to him. It's all over. You might as well forget it and give up. You've worked all these years to build up this herd, and now look what's happened. You tried to be good to this guy, and he took advantage of you. That's the way it is with people. Can't trust anybody. <laughs> See, you're all giggling because you know that's not God. You instinctively know that's not the way God talks to us. Well, if we're so smart, then why is it when the devil talks to us like that, we believe him? That's like the lady who came to the altar one time and asked me to pray for her. And she said, I tell you what, the devil's been lying to me and I'm so upset. I said, excuse me? The devil is lying to you. So that means you know it's the devil, you know it's not true, but it's got you upset. <laughs> got you, didn't I? <laughs> I think that means you're getting a breakthrough, sister. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty funny when you think about it. I say, the, the devil said to me, and he just, the devil's just lying to me, and I just, the devil's putting all these things in my mind. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had left him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are. Don't sit around and stare at what you got. He said, look north, south, east, and west. Watch this. For all the land which you see, I'll give it to you. And I'll say to you tonight, frankly, it doesn't matter all that much what's going on in your life right now. Because with God, you've got an awesome future. And I'm telling you, stop staring at what you've got now or what you don't have now. Lift up your eyes. Call on the name of the Lord. And look out there. And whatever you see by faith, God will give it to you. Don't see yourself always the way you are. I tell you, I see myself getting sweeter and sweeter and sweeter every day. <laughs> Woo, I'm getting so nice. I tell you what. Lordy me. <laughs> now that is not funny. Start with me. I haven't had a laughing meeting in a while. I could use one. <laughs> you 
You know, the truth of the matter is, some of you have cried long enough. And a good laugh might just do you a whole lot of good. Because some of the stuff we get upset about, if you look at it realistically, is pretty laughable. <laughs> Go to Genesis 11.6. <laughs> I'm just up here trying to preach, folks. That's... And the Lord said, Behold, they are all one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And now nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. <laughs> Being positive is so powerful that God actually said, If you'll believe and you'll stretch out your faith, Nothing that you imagine will be impossible for you with God. So you don't realize how impossible what I'm doing is. I mean, you really don't get it. I don't know what you think about me, but I can tell you what, I am just nothing, nobody from nowhere. But what God has done in my life is just, I mean, just want you to go around with your, with your jaw hanging open. I mean, I'm just like... It's amazing. Don't have a bad attitude. Go to Numbers 14. The Israelites had such a bad attitude. And it was such a shame because they could have made it out of that wilderness in 11 days. And they spent 40 years there. I don't want to see that happen to you. I wasted so much of my time and I don't want to see that happen to you. Numbers 14, just going to look at three groups of scripture that shows you the bad attitude they had. Numbers 14, 2 and 3, all the Israelites grumbled and they hated their situation, <laughs> accused Moses and Aaron, of course it was always somebody else's fault, to whom the whole congregation said, well, we just wish we would have died in Egypt. Or we just wish we'd just go ahead and die out here in this wilderness. Why does the Lord, now it's God's fault, why does the Lord bring us out to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones are going to become a prey for the enemy. It would, just, it would just be better for us to go back to Egypt. Anybody recognize that attitude? Numbers 20, verses 2 through 4. Think your way out of bondage. You can think your way out of bondage. You sit and think, I've got a future. God's got a plan. I want to encourage you tonight. Now there was no water, Numbers chapter 20, verses 2, 3, and 4. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled together against Moses and Aaron. And all the people contended with Moses and said, We wish that we would have died with when our brethren died out in the plague before the Lord. And why have you brought us up out of the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, we and our livestock? Numbers 21, 4 and 5. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, depressed, and much discouraged because of the trials of the way. And the people spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And we hate this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manna. Everybody say bad attitude. bad attitude. 
Now watch what happened, verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery burning serpents among the people. <laughs> and they bit the people. And many of them died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. Now, I think it's a shame that we got to get to that point in our lives because we real, before we realize we got a bad attitude. It's a shame that we act so bad that we throw a door wide open for the devil to come in and destroy us, and it takes all of that before we finally go to God and say, you know what, God, I am so sorry for having a bad attitude. You are so good to me, and there is no reason for the bad attitude I've had. There's no reason for me to be as negative as I am. You're good. You're awesome. You can do anything. Come on, I believe sometimes we need to get to the point where we just repent for having a bad attitude. Is there anybody here who walked in tonight with a bad attitude and you're going to go out without it? Anybody who needs a mindset change? How many need to be a little more positive? How many of you need to have a vision for your future and stop just thinking you're at the end of everything? You know what, then you're in the right place tonight. Look at me and let me tell you something. You can wish all you want to, and it's not going to get you out of bondage. You've got to start with right thinking and right speaking. Because unless you get in agreement with God, God can't do anything in your life. Amos 3, 3 says, how can two walk together unless they get in agreement? Otherwise, one's pulling one way and one's pulling the other. And that's the way it is sometimes with God. He's trying to get us to have faith and go over here. And we're over here being negative and full of doubt and unbelief and going this way. No wonder we feel like we're being pulled apart all the time. We even say that. I don't know what my problem is. I just feel like I'm being pulled apart. Well, go with God and you won't feel that way anymore. Amen. Ooh, I love to preach. <laughs> you're going to remain where you're at if all you ever see is what you have. Wrong mindset number two, they had, if somebody do it for me, I don't want to take the responsibility. And here was the lie the devil probably told them. Oh, yuck, I don't want to do that. There's so many people that just don't want to do what they need to do to get out of trouble. I always marvel at the man who laid by the gate beautiful for 38 years, crippled, and Jesus came to him and said, do you really want to get well? Are you really serious about getting well? And the first thing the man started doing was giving him all kinds of excuses. Well, every time I try to get into the water, somebody always gets ahead of me, and I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. <laughs> Well, see, if you've been laying somewhere 38 years in your mess, waiting for somebody else to come along and fix you, <laughs> you know, I could have felt sorry for myself for a hundred years because I was abused in my childhood and it would have never made me had a better life now. Do you hear me? I could have hated my father and I could have hated my, my, my relatives and all the other people who wouldn't help me and I could have just been full of bitterness and hatred and I was for a lot of years and I stayed stuck in the stupid wilderness. I was a Christian, I'd received Jesus as my Savior, and I believe I would have gone to heaven when I died because I really did love God. But I never had any victory because I had a bad attitude. It wasn't because of the devil, it was because I had a bad attitude and I had a wrong mindset. You can help yourself. You can have a better life if you want to and it can start right away. You can have more joy right away than you've ever had before in your life if you will just do something about that stinking thinking. Boy, I'm preaching good tonight. Everybody say, I can do something about my mess. Amen. You know, God gave Joshua something to do. He said, I've given you the land. Now, every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, I have given it unto you. In other words, God already made up his mind, Joshua, it's yours. Now go take it. Do you hear me? Every promise of God is yours, but you got to go take it. If you sit passively by and you're a do-nothing and you won't take responsibility, the devil's going to have you. 
But if you're active and energetic and on fire with zeal and passion for God, and if you love the Word, and if you're a prayer, and if you bless other people, the devil's not going to want to know what to do with you. Don't be a complainer, be a praiser. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, we complain about so many things that we're going to have to do anyway. Why don't we just go do them and zip our lip? <laughs> One of the girls that works for me who actually happens to be here this weekend was with me last weekend somewhere and she was at my house helping me do something, and she said, oh, man, i got to go to the grocery store today. Ooh, I hate going to the grocery store. I just hate going to the grocery store. I don't know what to get anyway. I don't know what my husband and my kid want to eat. You never know what they want to eat. Got to try to figure out what to get. Get it in the cart, pay for it, take it home, put it away. I hate going to the grocery store. I said, now you stop that right now. You are just setting yourself up for a lousy day. I said, you are just setting yourself up for a lousy day. We ruin our own days with our own thinking. Like I said this morning, some of us, before we ever get our feet on the floor, we're mad at six people. Because we lay in bed and we get ourselves ready. Boy, well, they better not do this. And if they say that, I'm going to tell them this. And boy, if Dave does this today, that's it. I'm not putting up with that anymore. I mean, before we get up, we got the ulcer stirred up. And we got a headache and we're just ready to knock somebody's head off the first time somebody moves. <laughs> You know, dread is a close relative of fear. And there's no point in dreading or hating anything or having a bad attitude about anything that you know you have to do. I said, you're going to go to the grocery store anyway, right? Well, yeah, I have to go if we're going to eat. <laughs> well, then make your mind up. I'm going to enjoy it. Amen? Amen. Come on, you've got enough authority in Jesus to at least be able to enjoy going to the grocery store. <laughs> the Lord told me one time, you're out trying to cast out devils and you don't even have authority over a sink full of dirty dishes. <laughs> I mean, I'd look at my laundry and get to her. All I ever do is work. <laughs> and then I'd go to some church service and there are devils under my feet. <laughs> Come on, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know those songs we sing? He's under my feet. He's under my feet. The devil is under my feet. And then we go home and look at the dirty dishes. Oh, man, I got to go to the grocery store, and I'm so sick and tired of doing this laundry. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Come on, we need to wake up. If we can't get this stuff to work in the kitchen, it's not going to work anywhere else. <laughs> man, we need a new attitude. One of the lies the devil tells us is, it's just too hard. <laughs> Life is just too hard. It's too hard to lose weight. It's too hard to exercise. It's too hard to say no to that chocolate bar. It's too hard to get out of debt. It's too hard to forgive people.
I'll tell you what's harder. Staying in bondage all of your life. Now that's hard. Living a life where you are miserable the whole entire time, every single day. Now that's hard. And you know what? Deuteronomy 30 verse 11 says, not one commandment of God is too hard. Nothing the Lord has told you to do is too difficult for you to do. You can look it up later. Deuteronomy 30, 11. Nothing that God tells you to do is too hard for you to do. Go to Philippians 4. Come on, are you getting something tonight? I hope that you're getting what I feel because I'm telling you, if you'll just make your mind up that you're going to have a good attitude, the devil cannot defeat you. And remember what I said this morning, you can think whatever you want to think. You don't have to think something negative just because it falls in your head. You can cast that out and think what you want to. Verse 13. Philippians 4.13, this should be our attitude and our mindset. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. Look at the Amplified here on the overhead. I'm ready for anything, and I'm equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Here's your new mindset. I can do whatever I need to do. I can do whatever I need to do. Nothing is too hard for God, and He lives on the inside of me. Don't look at all your problems and say, it's just too much for me. I'm just going to quit and give up. Fault finding, complaining, we talked about that. We make decisions and we complain about the results. We schedule more than we can do than complain about how busy we are. We buy things and complain about our bills. We overeat and then complain about what we weigh. We ask God for children and then complain because we got them. We beg God to give us somebody to marry. <laughs> Some of this stuff you're unhappy about, you ought to remember back to when you were begging God to give it to you. <laughs> you. The antidote for complaining is being thankful on purpose. Another wrong mindset is I can't wait any longer. <laughs> What you need to say is God's timing is perfect in my life. Not when, God, when. I just can't wait any longer, God. I just can't stand it. If you don't do something today, God, I'm just giving up. Threatening God never does one bit of good. <laughs> Somebody back there has found that out. Here's another really, really, really bad mindset and bad attitude. Well, it's not my fault. Don't blame me. It's not my fault. Are you like I am or like I used to be? I think I'm getting over at least some of this. Every time Dave would try to correct me or somebody else, I'd come right back and, well, you do this. <laughs> if he say, well, now, you know, Joyce, you really shouldn't have had that attitude. Well, you don't always have such a good attitude yourself. <laughs> come on. Anybody like that? Oh, no, the Bible says we're to receive correction. <laughs> Ooh, that's painful even saying it. I mean, isn't it? Receive correction. Oh, thank you for correcting. <laughs> you know, the whole thing started in the garden. I'm glad I'm making you all so happy tonight. <laughs> I'm just really trying to preach. I'm about to give up and just let you laugh. <gasps> Man.
Praise the Lord. <laughs> you guys are getting me so messed up, I can't even preach. Anybody know who Zacchaeus is, the little guy that couldn't see Jesus and he climbed a tree? That's the attitude that I want you to have from now on. He had a disadvantage. What some people would have called a handicap. Jesus was coming by and everybody could see but Zacchaeus. And the Bible says he ran on ahead and climbed a tree. And when Jesus passed by, he looked up at him in that tree. He said, Come on down here. I'm going to your house for dinner. Now listen, why out of all those people <laughs> did Jesus notice the little Zacchaeus in the tree and why did he choose his house to go to dinner? I'll tell you why. Because that's the kind of attitude that Jesus likes. Not one of self-pity and poor me and I'm too little and I'm not this and I'm not that. And what he's in me is lifting me up on their shoulders so I can see Jesus. He said, I'm not going to be stopped by nothing. Some of you need to start climbing trees. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I had a woman that came by me in a book signing the other day and she'd heard me preach this message about six or seven years ago in Atlanta and she said, Joyce, I'm still climbing trees. <laughs> Get a good attitude and a good mindset so God can do what he wants to do in your life. This concludes this message. Thank you for listening. For more information about Joyce Meyer Ministries or to request a free catalog, please contact us on the internet at JoyceMeyer.org.